everybody, and you're all very welcome again to this uh, fifth fireside day, which we're just kicking off. And the subject today is um, why are PhD so sought after in startup sector? And just go through the usual housekeeping. We'll speak. Myself and Dara <clears throat> will introduce you to in a minute. We'll speak for about twenty minutes, and then we'll chat, and then we'll stop the recording, and there'll be free um, another free kind of ten minutes for questions and answers, and we'll finish at the end of the half hour. Uh, the final one will be in two weeks' time. We'll send you out some news about that. <clears throat> so first of all, I think um, you're very welcome there, and thank you very much for joining us today. Um, this is a subject that's very dear to my heart. It's startups, and the reason we're doing this chat is I, I just feel there's not enough information out there for PhDs as to what kind of a career opportunity it is and, and what an exciting one it is too. So maybe if you actually would like to tell us a little bit about yourself and your company Outport Sports that you're a co-founder of and indeed um, and how you got to that point at this point now. Yeah, thanks to me and Jaren. Thanks me for uh, having me here as well to, to talk through the same today. Um, yeah, so my name is Dara Whelan. I'm currently the Chief Scientific Officer of Outport Sports. My own background is um, I guess very different than what you would imagine would end up potentially in a startup. I'm a physiotherapist by training. So I would have qualified as a physio back in 2009. I uh, worked clinically for a few years, both here and, and abroad in Singapore. Um, came back to Ireland, did a master's in sports and exercise medicine. That was kind of the area of speciality of physio that most appealed to myself. Pretty, I guess, frustrated, I guess, in a lot of the subjectivity involved in, in things like making return to play decisions and objectifying performance metrics or showing progressions in rehab. So I was always very keen to try and look at ways of objectifying that a bit more and be able to obviously gauge your own work and, and show the same to patients or athletes. So that kind of led me to going back and doing further research about the ability to do the same. So that led me to meet Professor Brian Caulfield, who's um, the um, uh, works is in the Insight Center for Data Analytics in uh, UCD as well. Got talking to him, and he mentioned about using wearable technology as a mechanism of doing the same because wearable technology, and we can kind of talk about what that is as well, with a very small, ubiquitous sensor. So it's quite easy and, and quite. Uh, simple to, to have access to them uh, and that allows you then to, to maybe measure performance outside of high-end lab environments with it. So I uh, started that PhD back in 2013, very lucky that at the same time I started the PhD, uh, uh, my co-founder of Output Sports, but at that stage just fellow PhD student, uh, Martin O'Reilly started with me. Um, we basically collaborated for four years during that PhD from 2013 to 2017 then basically bridged out got a, an Enterprise Ireland commercialization fund that basically allowed us to bridge our fundamental research into commercial offering. Um, and that's when we brought on our third co-founder, Julian Everly. The three of us have been kind of driving the Output Sports project uh, um, from that point with it as, as the three main co-founders of the company. And what we then did was seek investment. So basically we secured a, a seed fund round. And again, I can get into kind of what that is and um, and how you use it but basically what it is is money to allow you to grow your team and to allow you to scale your operations we secured that back in february of last year and that's allowed us to uh, bring on board now and um, we're up to about nine staff with it as well which is really exciting as well and again very different from from what i was used to doing maybe back in the phd but what mm -hmm. I, sports is as a whole, it's, it's basically a wearable sensor. Predominantly, we actually use some camera-based technique, but predominantly we use a, a small sensor like this to measure lots of different performance metrics, predominantly in, in sports and rehabilitation. So we measure maybe power, speed, agility, uh, mobility, strength, uh, lots of these different pieces of, I guess, the fitness jigsaw. And we pool them all together for practitioners. So predominantly our end users will be sports scientists, strength coaches, physiotherapists, and they will take all of that information, gauge what, how their athlete or their patient is doing at that stage, and then make informed decisions about their rehab progressions or strength programs or strength pathways. Um, the same. So that's, I guess, yeah, seven, yeah. eight years of my life condensed into... <laughs> yeah, in, into, two, into two or three minutes. Uh, it, it, there's a lot of passion in there, Martin, or um, Dara, I feel yourself and Martin, I should say, you know, it seems to be a lot of passion that you brought to this. So it, which kind of brings me on to the next question that I have for you, in your opinion, and, you know, and I suppose this cohort that we're speaking to now at the moment is graduate researchers or PhDs, like you were one day yourself, like yourself and Martin were. So what do you feel are the, um, what do you feel is the 
best skills and even if you want to go into personality type as well a little bit there in terms of that suits the startup sector you know i mean would you have an opinion on that or maybe yeah don't? no 100 percent um and i guess they're actually very similar to a lot of the skills that you learn along a phd route um so predominantly resilience <laughs> being like All a right. huge one uh like you see lots of graphs of doing a startup where it's like peaks and troughs and peaks and troughs and, yeah. up and down with it and you see the same graphs basically repurposed for like phds as well and it's because it is the same journey it's not doing the same thing each day with it you're doing lots of different things with it and because of that you'll hit speed bumps along the way with it so it's being able to i guess pick yourself up and carry on and and, and I guess, believe in the end product of what you're creating, whether it be a piece of novel research or whether it be something commercial like output sports, but it, that's huge. Uh, another one would be around, and um, we all say this, what PhD teaches you, but also what we look for in any individual as well is problem solving capabilities as well. So it's so, so important, no matter what I think you're working at with it is that you have a structure around how you go about solving problems and that, one of the things I've learned from, I worked with a lot of engineers in the Insight Center for Data Analytics, and one thing I found they were really, really good at was taking that problem solving approach and applying it to lots of different problems with it as well. And something I've really tried to upskill on, I think is super, super important in any um, environment, particularly startups where you're going to encounter problems that are maybe outside of your comfort zone or you haven't encountered before, but you need to be able to solve. And then finally, kind of related to that as well is adaptability. And again, a PhD will, will teach you that you need to be agile and adapt to kind of what's happening with it. But in a startup, it's that as well. Probably sometimes I find times a hundred at times with it where it's you're you're literally doing things, everything is diverse as collecting data to build new system features, to trying to develop a sales pipeline, to you know, trying to organize shipping of sensors or packaging of the same with it. And, that could all be in the space of an hour, if that makes sense. So you need to be very uh, adaptable and it's not that you feel like you can only contribute in one specific area. You need to have the ability to be able to contribute to lots of different areas of, of the business with it as well. And again, that's quite similar a skill to what you'd learn in a, in a PhD as well. Yeah. Uh, so what you're describing to me there is, you know, you're talking about the resilience and the problem solving, the adaptability, and, it, and you're absolutely right. This is what PhD is kind of, you know, automatically do and learn along the way. But you're also, um, I feel you're describing to me, you're giving me an image of uh, a place that you would go to work and you're with people, um, other people that possibly have, have um, you know, slightly different disciplines to yourself, in, if, if I'm right, like Martin, like Martin is not, uh, you know, your background in physiotherapy and you have nine people. And then along the way, you hit these bumps and there's obviously very exciting times and very, um, you know, troublesome times. But it's like as if you want then come together and then do you all learn then from each other based on the project you're doing and and and, and i suppose i'm asking when you go into this scenario or the startup sector do you learn an awful lot it, it, you know do you learn an awful lot of new skills while you're there on a hundred percent and yeah like that was you would hope the plan like i'm in the office i'm literally the only person in our 10 person <laughs> office at the moment with it but even still doing it through Zoom and we, what we hope is at some stage when it's safe to do, we would have everyone in the office as well. But even through Zoom, you still find it that what it is, is people coming with different disciplines. Mm -hmm. So obviously that's how output kind of originated. It was a physio and a sports and exercise engineer collaborating over a problem that um, we had both seen in Martin when he was doing his own workout programming, but he'd seen IMU could help with and me when I was maybe assessing patients and clients and athletes with it. And that different way of approaching problems was really, really useful, I guess, during our PhD research. So when we transitioned into the startup sector, we were very keen to try and do something similar. So to look for people with multidiscipline backgrounds with it, who maybe could be able to, um, after we've maybe done a needs analysis of the, uh, the holes that we need filling and the gap, gap uh, knowledge gaps, I guess, that we have, we identify individuals who can come in and provide that knowledge while also learning from each other around upskilling and other areas with it. We've been very lucky to date that um, the people we brought on to the team with it have allowed us to do the same and, and that we learn an awful lot from their expertise with it as well as, as hopefully working together as a team to solve those problems. 
Well, it's quite a fun, it's quite, um, I know we're all working remotely now and it's all Zoom, as you said, but it sounds quite a, quite a fun environment as well. Is it like, you know, you, you're quite, a, a lot of PhDs are quite alone when they're doing, or feel, or perceive themselves to be quite alone when they're doing PhDs. And you, you sort of build an image. And I do know other people who've worked on startups. So, you know, that's why I, I'm quite excited about the area. Uh, you know, I like the idea of the area for um, people, PhDs, but it's, it's a bit of fun comes into it as well, I think, doesn't it? No, 100%. And yeah. I was actually quite lucky during my PhD in the Insight Centre, we had a, a kind of um, a personal sensing group at the Insight Centre as a whole, right. that it wasn't actually a very individual experience doing our PhDs. And, and you know, that started from the collaboration right from day one with Martin, but also with the wider group as a whole, and a lot of Brian Caulfield's research group with it. And that was huge for us, I think, as well. It, it always, it, it almost felt like, you know, like an undergraduate or my master's program were very close as well. You had a kind of group who you were kind of coming in with discussing the work that you were doing, but also having a bit of crack with as well, which was, mm. which was great. And we've tried to take that atmosphere again into to Apex Sports. It's been very different. So we secured our, our seed funding and were able to grow out the team, as I was saying, in February 2020. So we had people in this office for maybe two or three weeks, and we haven't had them in since, basically. We've had yeah. bits and parts of maybe one or two people being in at a time and then back to, you know, a lockdown scenario where nobody was coming into it. We've obviously try to keep that same uh, level of, I guess, excitement about what we're doing with it. And hopefully uh, a lot of the, well, the te whole team get that excitement. It's all being virtual to date. And, yeah. and as I was saying before, we're really looking forward to um, the stage where we can get everyone in and, and basically have all of that happening in-house. And, and actually a lot of our team haven't even met each other because we've onboarded people in a remote fashion. So while they hopefully do get to know each other through Zoom, to actually meet in person and get that, um, yeah. that, that I know, I know. start up as well, that would be really exciting for us as well. It's, it's sign of the times. You've just, um, you know, an image has again flashed through my mind and because you mentioned Insight and, and you know, the data centre, which is, uh, you know, very strong and, and they are in UCD and there's, you know, CRT programmes attached to Insight now at the moment and, and lots of PhDs. But it brings me back, believe it or not, to 2007, I think, so 2008, when my own daughter, she's now 30, was doing um, transition year, and, and she actually got on a project. There was somebody in Insight, I always remember it now, with a sewing machine. And um, it sounds odd, but she had a sewing machine. And that turned... And it's now, it, it's kind of, I realised from listening to you where this is all gone. At that stage, this person, that she was an American working in Insight, had a sewing machine and she was actually making trousers that which would kind of sense rain and shrink up. And, and look where it's gone. <laughs> just, just seeing the trajectory here now as you speak um, about it, it's, it's quite interesting the way it's all come to, to, to fruition in a, in a really big way. All those incremental little bits of research, multidisciplinary and creativity that comes together. And it's not just you, I mean, there's other startups spinning out of insight as well and from all the other academics in, you know, around Ireland. It's it's fantastic really, isn't it? 100%. In, insight, we're always very um, uh, helpful and supportive of transitioning and, and having, looking at taking, I guess, the research out of papers or book chapters or conferences yeah. and actually developing something that would impact on kind of real world environments with it as well. And, Plus that, myself and Martin during that period of time, that really suited us. Brian was brilliant around that as well. And that really suited us as well because we were always really keen and obviously we wanted to get, you know, our metrics and our publication yeah. and, and what we needed to do, create, you know, which is unbelievable. And when you think about the PhDs, you create a novel bit of research of the whole definition of the award. And that's a great achievement in any um, state or form with it. What we were really keen on doing is kind of looking at that bigger picture about how that novel piece of research was translatable in, in our case to physiotherapists like myself or sports scientists or strength coaches with it and not that it might just uh, lie in you know research papers that a select few people kind of look towards and um, that's maybe it it's it's almost like there's not much kind of follow on um, around that or, or following that with it but it is obviously getting you the metrics you need for a phd etc with it we were always really keen that we wanted to, to build something that wouldn't just live in those papers but would hopefully be you know in somebody's hand that was always our thought process because we could see what we were building yeah. throughout that process so i know that won't be the same for a lot of research with it but that we could put into someone's hand that we are doing with output now and um, kind of hopefully change and, and help aid practice has always been our thought process. Yeah, in other words, go into the real world with it. 
Yeah, yeah, and, and yeah. Again, not being flippant, like sometimes, you know, a lot of research isn't as easy. I'm, I'm kind of conscious that what we do, you wear a sensor, you do a jump, you get a jump height out. That's very easy yeah. for people to understand, where sometimes translations to real world yeah. can be maybe more abstract or require, I guess, more defined industry or academic knowledge around it to see that translation with it. But for us, that was exactly what we always were kind of seeing the picture of somebody having the sensor on them and physios using it to, to measure range of motion or strength coaches using yeah. it to measure power Fabulous. range. Fabulous. And, and, and of course, it, it, we know the discussion as to where all that could go, uh, you know, in terms of health and all the rest of it. But I know our time is moving on. So I, I kind of, the other thing I want to ask you, and this is like the question I get all the time and the one I can't answer really that well. But, you know, if a PhD is interested in, in, in going into the startup sector, there's two. Mm -hmm choose here there's no such thing as a website where you all advertise your jobs that, that it doesn't exist and um and then i know you don't have the time often or, or sometimes the money to go you know advertising on these big websites so if there's phd listening to us today and hopefully there are and what i want to get into the startup sector how would you advise pe pe individuals to go about it yes yeah, so, so maybe if they're if they're looking for a job as opposed to maybe transitioning to research if they're looking for a job Number one, like anything, try and figure it out around your passion because that will make it 10 times easier. And that may or may not be your research. It may not have anything to do with your research, particularly maybe as you're coming to an end of four years of study and you might want to move away from it. But if you're excited by the startup scene as a whole, it's funny that you mentioned that. Like we, we would actually post our jobs on, you know, a lot oh. of the kind of the general websites and actually yeah. UCD as well. We, we, we tend to do that on the UCD right. board as well with it. Um, but social media is another way we post our jobs with it as well. So basically, sorry, going back to the point that if you find an area you're interested in, start up in the field in an area um, where you're interested in, it'd be like following them, kind of keeping track. Mm. You know, you could probably mm. gauge at a stage for maybe where they've raised more money. That's probably a time when they're going out and hiring more yeah. people with it. And then if it is an area that you're kind of interested in, that is your research, your own network is very useful for that. Usually if you're doing PhD, you might be part of a research group. People will transition through that research group and maybe working in startups in that area where you're interested in. So I guess leveraging your own network and getting to know that with it as well. And again, a lot of startups, sometimes there isn't the sense of a formal job application or formal job process that might be more embedded in, I guess, more traditional or established companies with it. So there's never much harm in, you know, sending in a, a correspondence or an email or a CV yeah. saying, listen, I've kind of come across the business. I, I really like what you're doing. It really speaks to me because of this, this and this. Uh, I'd love to, to kind of be kept abreast of any kind of job openings. This is what I think I can bring, etc. Yeah. And usually, you know, a lot of time we may keep that CV on file and we're not looking for that individual at that present time. But when mm. we do go out to it, it might be something that we bring back up again and look at, at that individual again with it as well. So there's no harm in doing that either a lot of the time as well. So it, it sort of goes back to what we've done in earlier Fireside Fridays is, 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 you know, somebody examining themselves and saying, you know, what would I like? What do I have to give? And then going off and or almost I often say it'd be like a journalist, find out who's what's doing the stuff that excites you out there and then be proactive for yourself in terms of making contact. And as you said, following and I, I, I do know you are very active on social media. I mean, I, I, I was delighted when you got all that venture, uh, you know, when you got that, uh, Martin and yourself got that when in New York there was that about a year and a half ago, was it? Um, the funding, is it now? Or the, which, which, uh... You won an award. Remember you? You went to New York and there was a big breakthrough for output sports. I think it was New York. I remember seeing it on social media anyway. Yeah, I'm actually probably not the person to talk to. I'm pretty bad at that stuff. Uh, it's actually right. predominantly was Martin and Julie, right. our, our other co-founder, were very good at, at kind of social media. I, I got to make myself sound like a dinosaur here now. But, no. Uh, but they, they were far better at that. And actually, interestingly, on the scale of, of kind of on the chat of hiring people, we've literally just brought on someone to help with our digital marketing. Uh, oh. over the last uh, month or so with it which has been really exciting because particularly a lot of the team would have had really good ideas with that but time is so you know when you have so many things going on yeah, yeah. have someone who's come on board Catherine has been really helping us with that with it has been great um, around that with it as well so yeah we tried to stay active we are probably again selling to um, you know physio strength coaches either in sports teams or actually single individual practitioners 
So there is an element of, you know, we can get our technology out there in front of those individuals with it. It's not maybe something where you're selling to maybe a pharmaceutical company yes. may not have the same interest of what's happening on social media. But for us, we found it really important because um, particularly in an age the traditional maybe buying patterns may have been more conferences or attending or showing the technology in their sites with it. Obviously, the last year with no travel, that hasn't been uh, yeah. possible to do. So social media has been a really good way, I guess, of, yeah. of showing and people's first interaction with the technology being through that, that mechanism, which has been really important. I, yeah, I suppose for I mean, I, you know, I think it's very interesting that you say you don't look after the social media side of things, and I think that shows the kind of diversity of it as well. But I suppose where I, I was thinking about whatever I saw a year and a half ago, and you know, I, I was thinking like if I was a PhD at the time, these guys are growing. Now is the time to make. And I'm not just talking about your startup, but in general, when you see venture capital coming in, then, oh, they're probably actually going to take on more people. And you, as you said, moved at some point from a team of three to five to nine. And mm -hmm. it's at, at those incremental points that if a, an outsider can observe those in a startup and say, oh, yeah, I think maybe that's the time to make me make myself known to 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 this company. That's just kind of general thought on my part, you know. No, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and we've probably come to the end of our formal 20 minutes are coming up to it. Um, so I just, uh, you know, it, it, and we will stop the recording and then we we'll go for questions for a further 10 minutes. But before we do close off, I mean, in the very beginning, you sort of what you really started out by saying was that what you do as a PhD, which is res being resilient and being adaptable, being hardworking, is actually the skills that are absolutely, absolutely essential but required for the startup sector. And I suppose maybe I'll leave the last word to you on that um, in terms of, I, I think you would encourage somebody if they were interested to work in a startup, wouldn't you? Yeah, like again, it's you can imagine very individual about what, an, yeah. what, what someone wants to do. It's a very different, um, I guess, domain to going in and maybe you're doing one specific job, particularly in the early stages of a startup, that's not likely to be the case. So I guess, what you if you are interested in what you'd be looking to demonstrate is that you have a lot of transferable skills yeah, okay. that you learn from I guess, a PhD with it and obviously resilience adaptability and problem solving being those but I guess what we always kind of taught during our PhDs we do a lot more if you think about the things you do during PhD it's not like we didn't just look at wearable sensors and compare them to visual evaluation of physios which is what mm -hmm. I did in my PhD you know you collect data you analyze data with it you write up data you communicate your data in talks or conferences. You um, do a heap of other things around that. With it, you work and collaborate with people. All of those things are like really important skills. So in that process, you develop writing skills, communication skills, um, collaboration skills that may not necessarily you might overlook because it's just you, you're embedded in it. You think you're just doing it to get a paper written, but what you're actually doing in that process is you're developing a lot of skills that can be very adaptable beyond just the, I know now know how to work with wearable sensors and the signals that are derived from the same. Yeah. You're far more, you're able to do far more than just that because you, you've kind of learned that through the PhD. And I guess with us, we were always really keen when we look at individuals with it as well, is that, that they've maybe done stuff, not necessarily just pure PhD, but maybe outside the PhD, completely outside. Obviously, you can imagine sports really appeals to us based on our yeah. Yeah. interest and our backgrounds with it. But also that during the PhD, we did things like um, Pint of Science and Thesis in Three and, and those type of things with it. And they were all, I guess, our stepping stones to getting a stage where we were able to, to translate our research in an easy, communicable manner. If you're able to do that to, you know, a pub full of people, you're probably going to be able to do it in, you know, a investment room or an investment pitch and then following that in a board meeting or something like that. Because not everyone will have that same level of, of granularity, I guess, of understanding that you may have uh, regarding your research. But if you're taking it out into inverted commas, real world, would it, you'll need to be able to, to do other things, communicate that easier look at your user interface and how people operate with the technology straps it was a huge thing for us like literally none of us had any design or, or um kind of clothing expertise with it but we spent a lot of time trying to understand how you affix the sensor to an individual previously during our research we were just using uh, electric tape we we're just taping it around an individual but that obviously doesn't work with a product where people need to take it on and off very fast so yeah. we then then need to go and have a look at how to do that in a better matter 
don't know. So yeah, so you, I guess learning those things along that process, things that you don't think are specifically related to your research, yeah. they'll stand to you when you go for a position, like particularly in a startup, but I think in all jobs, that you can do more than just you know, work with wearable sensors and get sensor signals from them. You can do far more than that. And, and often, I think sometimes PhDs kind of focus in on what their area of expertise, what they've published on, but they're doing a lot more besides that, I guess. Okay, I think that's a really, a, a really terrific way to end this because and I, I see um, Emer in the background nodding away there because Emer looks after the RPDP, which is the Research Professional Development Plan, and she spoke about that a few weeks ago. And you know where you take stock, you know, especially at the end of stage one of your skills and then what you might develop before you go along. But I think if anything, that's a real incentive, and and it it it, it actually explains the real reason why we are so keen on the transferable skills. It's it's for the real world and it's it's and the point you're making is that you in fact have them and you're getting them but it's just realizing that you are doing that and you'll be able to talk about it then when we finish i think it's very much the message that we give out um to phds and I, before we, we will shut down the um the recording just now but before we do and then we stay on for a few minutes for uh questions and answers but i just want to say officially thank you very much dara and and wish you the very, very best of luck in output sports it's, it's been a fantastic learning experience I, I could talk to you all day but um we'll we'll finish now thank you thank you